This is where we left off in the last video, and then now we're going to use the fact from problem 2.1 that if your potential is an even function, then I can always take xi of x to be either an even or odd function. So don't forget that an even function satisfies this property, that f of negative x is equal to f of x. So this refers to a diagram that is symmetrical about the central vertical axis. So an even function will look something like this. So it's symmetrical about this axis. And because our potential is an even function, it looks like this, and you can see that it is definitely symmetrical about the central axis, then we know that our potential is an even function, and that is why I can always take xi of x to be either an even or an odd function. So in the demonstration uh, that Griffiths gives us in the book, he focuses on the solutions that are even functions. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on the solutions. We're fo going to focus on the xi of x's that are going to be even functions. So now that we know that xi of x is going to be an even function, we know that xi of x is going to satisfy this property. That means xi of x is going to be equal to uh, xi of negative x is going to be equal to xi of x. And so that means we can modify this expression to be equal to f e to the power of negative kx when x is larger than a, and then it is going to be equal to d times cosine lx within the interval negative a to positive a. So you can see that what I've changed is that I've taken away the sine, the sine term, because the sine term is an odd function. The sine is an odd function. Cosine, uh, on the other hand, is an even function, because you can see that cosine negative x is actually just equal to cosine of x. And so it, because xi of x, now we're requiring it to be an even function, I can just take away this odd term and then keep this cosine term. It is because we are restricting our xi of x to be an even function, so that's why we're, we, we are able to take away this sine term, because if this sine term is here, then uh, where we can't uh, restrict xi of x to be even. And so that is why we got rid of the sine term. And then when x is smaller than negative a, don't forget, xi of x needs to satisfy this property. And so that is why within the region x is smaller than negative a, it, it is going to be equal to f times e to the power of positive kx. So you can see that what I've changed this time is that I've taken away the constant b and I've changed it to f so that this property will be satisfied. So if this, if, uh, uh, this is f and this is b and both of these constants are different, then this relationship will not be satisfied. And now, because we know that this relationship is going to be satisfied, I can set b to be equal to f. And so now we have obtained uh, one extra level of simplification. And so now we're going to consider the continuity requirement. So we know that uh, at the region at positive a and negative a, your function xi of x it should be continuous at these two locations. And so that is why if I substitute a into this expression, so f times e to the power of negative ka, and I substitute a into this expression, so d cosine l a, both of these expressions should be equal. So that is how we enforce the con continuous requirement. And then notice that because this is an even function, I can just uh, make sure the function is continuous at positive a, and then it will all automatically be continuous at negative a. So all I have to do is just to focus on the part at positive a. And so that is how we obtain this, uh, this relationship. So using the continuity requirement, we have obtained another relationship between uh, the constants. Like so far, we have three unknowns. We don't know what f is, we don't know what d is, and then we don't know what the energy level e is. So if we can find the energy levels, this will also give us l and k, because don't forget, l and k are defined in terms of e. And so now with this, relationship over here we have uh, we have three unknowns and we need we'll have to use three relationships to in order to find these three uh, unknowns so this is the first relationship we can obtain by using the continuity requirement so the second thing we're going to second requirement we're going to use is that we're going to use the fact that dzi dx is also going to be continuous at these two locations at positive and negative a and the reason is if you you can look back at the chapter at the section on the direct delta function. Uh, there's a part where Griffiths integrates the Schrodinger equation, and you can see that if your potential is finite, so it doesn't go to infinity like the direct delta uh, potential, if your potential is finite, then your dz dx must be continuous. And because in our case, our, uh, our potential is definitely finite everywhere on the x-axis, so that is why we also know that dz dx should also be continuous. So in order to exploit this relation, uh, exploit this fact, we first need to take the derivative of xi of x. 
So taking the derivative of this, this is just negative kf times e to the power of negative kx, and this applies for the region x is larger than a. And then for the region negative a to positive a, we just differentiate this, so we get uh, negative l d sine lx. So co differentiating cosine becomes negative sine. And this applies for the region negative a to positive a. And I'm just going to leave the, the third term alone because once again I can ensure the continu uh, that dz dx is continuous at positive a and because this is an even function uh, the same will automatically also hold true for negative a. So I only need to concern myself with ensuring that dz dx is continuous at the location x is equal to a. So if dz dx is going to be continuous that means if I substitute in a for this uh, expression this should be equal to what I get when I substitute in a for this bottom expression. And so this relationship should hold true. And obviously I can just take away the negative signs. So now we have a second relationship. So now we have three unknowns and we have two relationships so, so far. And actually we can find the third uh, relationship by using the by using the fact that xi of x should be normalizable. So uh, I'm not going to normalize this uh, xi of x in this video, but uh, there is uh, one of the problems in this section it involves normalizing xi of x, so we can work on that later on. But uh, right now, using these two equations, we can actually already uh, deduce what this constant e should be. So we have three unknowns, and normally we would need three uh, equations to deduce what these three unknowns should be. And so far, we have two expressions, so we still like a third, and that third expression, that third relationship, would come from normalization. But at this point, even with these two relationships, we are actually already able to deduce what this, what the energy level E should be. So the thing we need to do next is that I'm going to uh, divide these two expressions by each other. So I'm going to take the numerator as this LD sine LX, and then I'm going to divide it by this term. So D cosine LX. And then the left-hand side, I just do the same. So KF E to the power of negative KA. It looks like I make, made a mistake. So this should be a instead of x. So la. And then on the left hand side, in the denominator, I just have f e to the power of negative ka. So you can see that these terms, they all cancel out. And then these d's, they cancel out. So in the end, I have on the left hand side k. And on the right hand side, I have l times tangent la. So you can see that in this entire equation, there is actually only one unknown. And the unknown is the energy level E, because don't forget, K is defined as negative 2ME divided by H bar, and L is equal to the square root of 2ME plus V naught divided by H bar. So you can see that in this entire expression, there is only one unknown, and that unknown is the energy level E. So if we are able to solve this equation, then we would be able to find what the unknown E should be. And uh, in order to do that, I'm going to try to simplify this term uh, uh, in, a, in a particular way. I'm going to define uh, the variable z to be equal to la and uh, this would allow me to simplify this term into something that looks nicer. So starting off we have kl times tangent la and I'm just going to switch la out with a z and then I'm going to multiply both sides by a so you can see you have another al so this is also equal to z so z times tangent z ak and then I like to think of this like this. So tangent z is equal to ak divided by z. So this is this kind of refers to a triangle where this side is equal to ak and then this side is equal to z. And then it ha also has an angle of z. And then by the Pythagorean theorem, we know that this side is equal to z squared plus a squared k squared. So that's how, how I like to think about this expression. And then don't forget that there is also a relationship among the trigonometric functions that 1 plus tangent square z is equal to secant square z. So secant is uh, 1 over cosine, in case you don't remember. So that's how I know that tangent z is actually equal to the square root of secant square z minus 1. So uh, there should be a plus minus sign over here, but in our case, uh, all these terms are positive, so I'm just going to focus on the case where uh, it's positive instead of uh, the negative case. And you can see that uh, I can express tangent z in such a way, and then according to this diagram, secant of z, which is just equal to 1 over cosine, is just equal to this length 
So z squared plus a squared k squared divided by z. So let's try to simplify this a bit further. So we know that secant of z is equal to the square root of z squared plus a squared k squared divided by z. And I'm just going to pull the a to the outside because don't forget z squared is also equal to uh, a squared l squared. So this becomes l squared plus k squared divided by z. And then don't forget l is uh, defined in such a way. So it's equal to uh, the square root of 2m e plus v naught. So l squared is just equal to 2m e plus v naught divided by h bar squared. And then k, don't forget, it's defined in a similar way. So if you square it, you just get negative 2m e divided by h bar squared. And you divide this by z. And you can see that these two e's, they cancel out. So in the end, in the in the numerator, you get 2m v naught divided by h bar squared divided by z. And then I'm, you can see that all of these are just constants. So I'm just going to call this uh, z naught. So I'm going to define z naught as being equal to this a times square root of 2m v naught divided by h bar. So you can, I can write all this out as some constant z naught divided by z. So this is what secant of z is equal to. And going back here, I can see you can see that I can now express tangent z in a in a much nicer form. So tangent z is equal to secant squared z minus one, and secant z is equal to to z naught divided by z. So this is what we get. So in the end, we get this expression. And then now you can see that this is a an equation with one unknown. So z naught is uh, is a constant, and then our unknown is z. So if we can solve this equation we would be able to find what the value z is. And then finding z, uh, because z is equal to a l, we would be able to find what l is. And then finding l, we would be able to find what the energy level is. So all that remains now is to find, uh, is to try to solve this equation. But in the end, this is actually a so-called transcendental equation, so I can't really solve this. I can't provide a closed form solution for this, so in the end you'll have to graph this out, and then you will have to uh, look for the intersection points. And those intersection points will be this is uh, uh, the values of z you're looking for. And then from those values of z, you will be able to deduce what your energy level